We are at the Detroit Zoo today. We're here to learn about tales of animals to go along with our summer reading program, Tales and Tales. We have Mike and he's going to tell us some things about his background such as, how did you become interested in animals, Mike? Good morning, everyone. I am Mike Reed, and I am one of the curators of education at the Detroit Zoological Society. Uh, specializes in uh, citizen science, which means I get a lot of opportunities to work with some of the kids and stuff in the community. And we are very excited to be here today. And a lot of times kids will ask me, how did I get into the zoo field? Well, actually, mine started back in kindergarten for our recess period. We didn't have a big gym space at my school. So what we used to do was go outside. So one of the things we did when we went outside um, was to walk around the neighborhood and to just listen, you know, for the different sounds from the different animals and stuff that were around the neighborhood. And so I would always listen for the sound and it was always very important to me to be able to identify what that sound was. So I had a very good teacher um, and she would make you work for it. In other words, when we go out there, she wouldn't just come back and go, oh yeah, that was a robin. Oh yeah, that was a blue jay. What she would say is, I don't know. Why don't you come back tomorrow and you tell me what kind of bird that was that you saw. So from that, it just kind of invested into me becoming a, uh, very interested in animals and in zoos and in science in general. You know, I always tell people what I am first and foremost as a scientist, and that was very important to me. Growing up, um, I didn't see very many examples of uh, scientists and stuff, so I always wanted to, you know, work on the few examples that I did have. So, um, you know, seeing people like George Washington Carver and all the things that he could do with just the peanut, you know, and I decided, hey, you know what, I'm going to get into science, I'm going to amaze my friends and stuff, and I used to make these little baking soda and vinegar um, bottle rockets and stuff and all that sort of thing, so it was just something that I was very interested in. What sort of schooling and training did you have once you finished high school? A lot of science. You know, as I said, I was first and foremost wanted to be into, to be a scientist. Um, and then I wanted to make sure that I worked with uh, either humans or animals. And quite frankly, animals were at the time a lot more interesting to me because um, there are such a variety of different types of animals and stuff. So I went off to school because I wanted to, to be away from home for a little bit. I had never had an opportunity to be outside of the city of Detroit. So I went away to um, Fair State. Uh, which is about the middle western side of uh, Michigan um, in the Lower Peninsula. And I stayed there for about a year and a half and then I came back home. And one of the reasons I came back home was because with uh, Wayne State, I knew a couple of people that were going there and it gave me an opportunity to, to work with a support group. And that's very important, especially when you're like a first generation uh, person going to college because there's no one at the house that can tell you what you need to be doing, how you need to be doing it. So having an opportunity to be with you know, other students like that, I think was probably the best career choice or future career choice I could have made was to, to come back um, home, Wayne State, get a group of kids and say, hey, look, you know, let's make sure that we all make, through, make it through together. You know, Let's all get together, let's, let's study, let's have study groups, let's make sure that we all understand what's going on. And then once I got into the zoo profession, there were, there are special courses. There is a zoo management program, uh, which is a very intense program that you, you go through, conservation programs. And I do a lot of uh, uh, reading too. Things like new, animals that are found or discovered that they didn't know existed and stuff like that. That kind of stuff really, 
really intrigued me. So getting into this, you have to want to first like science in general because you know a lot of the things that you're challenged with are science-based. So you know we want to make sure that we're doing the very best for the animals. How do you mentor and help children learn more about animals? That is my, my favorite part of my job. I always say that, you know, I, I went into supervision about um, 20, about 20 years ago or more. One of the things that at that point is you're no longer required to wear a uniform, um, but I have never given up you know, wearing the uniform. And one of the main reasons that I do that is because of the fact that kids or whatever will look up and they'll see the, the, the pats and they'll say, oh, you work at the Detroit Zoo? And then that opens up a, a you know, opportunity for conversation. Um, a lot of times they can get some of their long-term questions answered about animals. We can talk a little bit about how you can get into the zoo, as just like we were talking earlier. It gives them an opportunity to just sort of know that I'm no different than when you were, when you were, you know, than when I was a kid. I did some of the, the, the crazy things and all of that, but, you know, this was something that I wanted to do. And, you know, give them the opportunity to know that they can do it too. You know, we have programs where we take a group of kids up north and teach them survival skills. And survival skills, we mean survival skills out in the woods. And a lot of times they'll come back and they say, you know, before I was scared of the woods with the animals and all of that kind of stuff. But now that I have an understanding of them, I'm good with it and, and you know, I love it. So anytime you usually have a, a fear or something, it's because you know, you don't really understand it. So by mentoring, it gives me an opportunity for them to have an you know, opportunity to understand the career and realize that, you know, it's, it's a very rewarding, you know, career. And I spent a great deal of my time outside, you know, looking at animals from around the world. Is there an animal in particular that you are most interested in? Well, I would say the majority of the animals, because of their unique features and stuff that they have, they, they all have an appeal to me. Now, I can tell you one of the things that is unique that most people don't think about is that in the school system, you know, my nickname is the Spider-Man because I have an interest in spiders. Spiders are fascinating. The fact that spiders were walking the earth at the same time as dinosaurs, as a species and that they're still here. They're one of the few species that's able, you know, to do that. The fact that they can have this material called web that's very strong, you know, that man cannot produce no matter how hard they try. No matter how hard they try, people cannot produce the same strength as the spider can produce in, in, in the silk. So we were one of the first zoos to actually have the spectacle bear, which is the only South American species of bear born at the zoo. There's a lot of unique stuff out there and that's, that's what I really like. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the baby animals that were born this year? A couple of our most popular ones, we had a, a baby lion, a lion cub born, and we also had a polar bear uh, cub born, but we also uh, have other popular animals that gave birth this year. We've had a few penguins. And the only thing I can say is, you know, for the kids out there, come on out to the zoo and look around. Uh, one of the uh, species is um, uh, Japanese macaques, um, sometimes called snow monkeys. There's nothing cuter than seeing a little bitty Japanese macaque just trying to follow the mother. You know, you can stand there for hours and, and, and just watch that. So that's your opportunity to, to learn more about that animal. When you see an animal and you see, well, that's a young one that it was born, first thing you want to do is go back and take a look and research that animal. You know, perfect tie-in with the library, right? Right. You know, go back to the library and go and say, you know, 
How long is it gonna be before that Japanese macaque, the little baby is gonna get big enough to be about the size of the mother? How big is it gonna be? What does it eat? All of that is an opportunity for you to be able to have the opportunity to learn more about the, the animals. And I guarantee you, when you learn more about the animals, you learn more about science in general, and you learn more about the planet in general. About how many animals make their home at the Detroit Zoo? That's a question, because it changes on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. There are different zones that the zoo is divided up into. There are different buildings. You have the reptile building, you have the amphibian building, which we call our NAC. National Amphibian Conservation Center. Could you tell us some of the types of food that animals eat and where does it come from? If you ever see the animal diets that we have or anything, it looks better than what most of us eat. There is a commissary where um, all of the food diets and stuff are prepared. All of the food is researched to mimic the most natural to that animal species that it can possibly have. Whenever we have an opportunity to give the, the animal the same type of uh, diet that's in the, the wild, we do that. Whenever we have the opportunity so that the animal has to work for that food the same way it does in the wild, we, we do that as well. There are certain cases where some of the nutrients that are in the wild may not be in the diet. And at that case, the veterinary staff will work to make sure that that diet is supplemented. But again, that's another opportunity to learn more about the animals. And that's another opportunity for you to visit the library and research. And maybe one day you come out here and tell me something I didn't know even, you know, so it's always an opportunity to learn new things. Mike, one of the children wanted to know, are there some animal snacks that might surprise us? One of the things that uh, we have in the zoo field is we have a um, term that we call browse. And browse would be where you would go to a tree species, a specific tree species, and uh, take off some of the leaf material, some of the extra leaf material and the animals love to eat it. It's an opportunity for them to do some of the skills that they normally would do in the wild. A, a good example is like mulberry, and then there are the long trees that look like they're just leaves coming straight down, which we call weeping willows, and that is a favorite of the animals. There are species of amphibians and stuff that like things like crickets. And then there's things that we actually will feed to the animal when we want them to either move to a different location or come inside. For example, with a spectacle bear species um, that we had, it, it loved peanut butter. So that whenever we put it out, we would put peanut butter in the hole. And it's not only that, I mean, some of our chimps like the, the peanut butter as well. Um, so there's, and different types of fruit. So there's an opportunity for you know, the animal to exhibit some of the behavior that it would in the wild, and at the same time, get a treat. That way you don't have to use any type of restraint, which is very important to us, is the fact that you know, animals have an opportunity to just sort of you know, move on their own without us having to go in there and restrain the animal and physically move it. So there's a lot of work done with um, discovering some of those unique things that um, they may not even in the wild have access to, but they really like it. And that, that allows us to do a lot of uh, different types of uh, you know, behavior work with them. What does the zoo do with all the animal waste? That is a terrific question um, because there is a lot of it. <laughs> and not only is there a lot of it, there's a lot of variety of it. So that answer, um, you know, has a lot of variety to it. But I will say this, one of the unique things that we have now is we're one of the first zoos, not the first zoo to have an anaerobic digester. So what we do is we take the waste and put it in the anaerobic digester, and mix it up with other things. Let's just say that it's not totally operational right now, but we are working towards the point where at some point we will be able to put the waste into that and turn it into electricity. 
How does zoo staff know when an animal might be sick? Communication with the animals. They can communicate well between themselves, but communicating to us, we use different you know, methods. So therefore, one of the first things that a keeper does in the morning is they come in and they might have a certain routine that they do, like they may have this particular species. They may have them go through a series of, uh, you know, tunnels or something like that. But it's not just to get them outside, but the point is that you want to get eyes on that animal. And if that animal, just like with human beings, a lot of the kids that are out there, you know, if they're not feeling well, one of the first people to, to notice is whatever adults in their household because they notice they're not themselves. I mean, if you wake up every morning and you have your bowl of oatmeal and you run downstairs to get the oatmeal, well, if you wake up one morning and instead of running downstairs, you slowly crawl downstairs, then someone knows something is wrong. And so that's why it's very important that the keepers have an opportunity to spend time just visually looking at the animal so that they learn the behavior of each um, individual animal because they are all individuals. A lot of times when people come out to the zoo, they go, oh, zebras. And, you know, they're talking about the whole group, right? But each zebra is an individual animal. So it is on the keeper and the care staff to know this is the behavior that is normal for this particular zebra. And if that behavior is not exhibited that day, then it's a caution for us to do more um, observation. And if that observation continues to show that there is not the normal behavior, then um, at that point, we must work with the medical staff to find out exactly why that animal is not using or doing its normal behavior. What sort of training do zoo staff get to safely interact with animals? One of the first things that uh, zoo staff looks at is the fact that each animal is an individual. So a lot of times when I talk to kids and adults too as well, they'll say, well, this particular animal doesn't do this. This particular animal doesn't do that. And I always say animals are individuals. So you have to work with that animal and learn what it does and does not do and what it is and is not comfortable with. So the first training session happens is for them to work with the keeper who is familiar with those particular individual animals so that they're introduced to them and that they can then develop that sort of uh, connection you know, with those animals so that they know when they might be having a good or a bad day. Is it true that one shouldn't look animals straight in the eye? What I always you know, say all the time is the fact that there's no all of anything. There are certain animals that, you know, that is a behavior that is considered a threat. There are certain other species of animal that that behavior makes them feel uncomfortable and therefore you know, they will move away. With all of the research that, you know, over the summer <laughs> that you'll be doing or working in, in, the, in the library, that is a fantastic question that you could probably use to write a, a grade A research paper on and stuff. Because again, always keep in mind, if you learn nothing else from today, is the fact that just like animals have different shapes and sizes of tails. Um, they have different shapes and sizes of personality.